When Jesus says to you and to me, go into all the world, preach the gospel, disciple nations, you may be like me going, wait a minute. (laughs) All we've got is a kid's lunch. And if we'll listen further, he gives a step-by-step approach because he's not changing his plan. I'm fascinated by, well, by everything Jesus did, but a story that stands out to me in this moment is the fact that Jesus, the disciples had come to him saying, the crowds, the crowd needs to go home. We have no food. They're starving. Send them away. And Jesus said, you feed them. Which is just a classic moment because you got to imagine the disciples are waiting for him to laugh and hit him on the shoulder and say, "Just kidding," you know. <laughs> after after he gives this command, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't break into laughter. He says, "You feed them," and and they're nervously trying to figure out how in the world can we do that? If we had the food, we we couldn't do that. And so Jesus, all he does is he <clears throat> he gives them. He gives them something to do. He says, have the people sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Okay. Anybody have food here? Yeah, there's a kid with lunch. All right. So Jesus could have created up nothing, but he usually creates with something. It's fascinating that he, he easily could have just from nothing, but... These miracles that we see in Scripture actually started, he had something to work with. And so in John's Gospel, when he talks about this situation, it said, when he broke the bread, when he gave thanks, he distributed it to the disciples, and it it became more than enough. But when he gave thanks, what did he give thanks for? He gave thanks for not enough. He gave thanks when it was way (laughs) insufficient. See, when you take what isn't enough and you baptize it in thankfulness, it becomes supernaturally positioned to be more than enough. It's the power of thanksgiving. It's the power of a thankful heart. An unthankful heart is is imprisoned by numbers and limitations and restrictions. A thankful heart is positioned to see increase. In John's gospel, it says there are 5,000 men besides women and children. This happened at two different times. This is the multiplying of at least twice that we know of. And it says there are 5,000 men not counting women and children. Where did the loaves and fishes come from? From a child. Someone who didn't count. You heard it in the video tonight with the the global response where the Ukrainian people are saying, "We, we, we thought the world forgot us. We thought even God forgot us. And he said... The world maybe has, but God hasn't forgotten. There's, there's, something, there's something profoundly significant by recognizing the value of an individual. And here Jesus honors a child. I don't know if there were other lunches that were there. It wasn't important. It was the one that was given to him was from a child. And Jesus took. And he didn't throw it in the air and go, Shazam. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's face it, crowd control. You don't, you don't create a mountain of food in front of a, thousands of hungry people. Instead, what he did is he divided it into 12 baskets. And the disciples distributed. How much was in a basket? I don't know. That much? I don't know. But 12 baskets is not enough to feed 
5,000 men besides women and children. Can we say 15,000 people? 12 baskets isn't near enough. Unless it multiplies as you're giving it out. So when Jesus said, you feed them, he didn't change his mind when they said, we have no food. He didn't change his mind when they were puzzled by the challenge. He didn't change his mind. All he did was enable them to do simple actions that he would bless and cause food to multiply. In other words, there's a point of obedience. Most miracles are connected to a point of obedience. And we usually wait for something to happen to us when oftentimes we're supposed to take faith and put it into an action. The blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's a cruel assignment for a guy who's blind. You've got to go to another geographical location and wash in a specific pool. But there was something in his makeup that needed, confronting is too strong of a word. It needed to be, there's something that needed to be exercised in him, in his obedience. So many times we see actions, we see blind Bartimaeus take off his beggar's robe. There's a, a profound action. It's what qualified him as a legal beggar in that culture. People would see that garment to know he was legitimately blind and needed help. So when he took that off, extraordinary act of faith. But actions have to take place. I, I, I remember through the years, so often I would, I would have people do something, um, not, uh, you, you know, if you've got a broken ankle, I wouldn't say stand up here on the stage and jump off to test and see if it's healed. Gabe might, but, but, but <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't do that unless he told me to. I wouldn't do it out of the principle of faith. P please listen to this carefully. I will not put anybody at risk out of the principle of faith. I at times will have to put myself at risk out of the principle of faith because I'm not getting a breakthrough. But I, can't, I have no right to put you at risk. Let me illustrate it. Is it true that the widow gave her last meal to the prophet and that was the key to her economic breakthrough for the next season. Is it true? R read your Bibles, because it's in there. And it's a really good story. So it's a, it's, an, it's, it's a principle of faith. She emptied her own resources and gave to the prophet. I'm grieved at how often I hear people in this position use that to tell people that's what they need to do. You never put somebody else at risk. Unless he says so. And the most terrifying thing, I think, for that prophet was for him to bring a word to a widow who was down to her last meal. And he's got to tell her that the key to her breakthrough is you feed me first. Some would automatically think that's arrogance. I think it's the absolute greatest demonstration of humility because it's obeying to a point you make yourself look foolish. I want you to look uh, with me at uh, John chapter 3. And I, I've talked about this so many times, I feel a little bit embarrassed doing it again, but I, it just, actually at the end of worship, I felt, like, I felt like I should talk to you about this. And I'll, I'll try to hurry through the parts I've done so many times. <clears throat> so when Jesus told his disciples, you feed them, and they were clueless as to what to do, They knew they didn't have enough. He didn't change the assignment. He just enabled them through simple step-by-step -step instruction, enabled them to do what was actually impossible. 
When Jesus says to you and to me, go into all the world, preach the gospel, disciple nations, you may be like me going, wait a minute. <laughs> all we've got is a kid's lunch. And if we'll listen further, he gives us step-by-step -step approach because he's not changing his plan. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to say, all right, it's a little rough making you like me. I'll tell you what, I'll try to make you like John <laughs> or Fred, you know, whoever. He doesn't change his plan. He's got, he's got an assignment for you and, and for me.